<laughs> I hope you brought a Bible this morning. Uh, I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 41. We've been looking at the life of Joseph. Joseph, the man of God, who is given more space in the Bible than any other Old Testament character. More than David, more than Moses. Isn't that something? Um, so we're going to continue in our study of the life of Joseph. I've, I'm, I'm going to call my message today, What a Difference a Day Makes. Now, I know some of you all remember that song. I know Bob remembers it. <laughs> yep, Donna Washington, uh, yeah, Donna Washington made it famous in 1959. She won a Grammy for it. Oh, and ry rhythm and blues, what a difference a day makes. 24 little hours uh, brought the sun and the flowers where there used to be rain. The idea is one day can change everything. You never, don't, you, you never want to give up too soon. In fact, you want to hold on, hold out, stay faithful, because what a difference a day makes. You know, when we finished uh, last week looking at the life of Joseph, uh, he was in jail. He'd been falsely accused by the, the man's wife, the man that he worked for, a man named Potiphar. He'd been a faithful servant to Potiphar. He had prospered Potiphar's business. And when Potiphar's wife tried to make a move on him, he refused her. Uh, and for doing right, doing the right thing, for not betraying God or betraying his master Potiphar, the wife accused him of attempting to seduce her, rape her, and he was thrown into prison on these false charges where he languished for several years. We don't know exactly how many years he was in jail, but one thing we do know that in chapter 41, uh, where we'll be reading today, the Bible says that it came to pass at the end of two full years. So we know he was in two years after the events of chapter 40, where... If you remember, he had interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker who were thrown into prison. These were the king's uh, wine taster, food taster, uh, was thrown in prison along with the baker because uh, some plot apparently was discovered. They thought somebody was trying to poison the king. These two were thrown in the jail. They both had dreams. We covered this last week, but for those of you who weren't here, I'm just kind of bringing you up to speed. They both had dreams. Joseph interpreted those dreams, and exactly as he had interpreted them, that's how it came to pass, just exactly what he said. The butler was released and returned to a place of service. So the charges against him were found false. He was vindicated. He's back serving the king. Joseph had just asked one thing, don't forget me. Don't let me languish here in this jail. Jail is a terrible place. A terrible place of despair and hopelessness. And as bad as jails are today, we can't even begin to imagine what they were like in Egypt thousands of years ago. When generally they were dark holes in the ground where people were lowered down into those holes. I mean, you talk about no place of escape. There's no escaping those jails. And then everything was underground, caverns, uh, shackles, chains. Uh, this was no picnic for Joseph, even though the Lord blessed him there. The Lord blessed him while he was in jail. We read that, that while he was in the prison, the Lord was with him. Verse 21 of chapter 39, and says, And the Lord showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison knew that Joseph was a trustworthy and reliable man and, and put really the control of the whole prison in his hands. Nevertheless, every morning he woke up and you couldn't hardly tell whether it was day or night. 
because in those dark, dank prisons, everything looked the same. Two years passed. Two years after he interpreted those dreams. And every day looked like the day before it. Just gray, dark. You ever feel like your life's in a holding pattern? <laughs> like nothing is really progressing. Nothing is, nothing is really happening. No, like there's no progress in your life. No answers to prayer. It's just like you're in a holding pattern. You ever flew in an airplane and got put in a holding pattern? Well, that's a real joy, you know. <laughs> It's bad enough you have to fly. We were talking about that before service. You know, flying is not one of my favorite things to do. We do it because it's uh, convenient, generally. But, you know, if you're traveling long distances. But the tight little quarters, the cramped airspace, the no leg room, you know, the monotony and all that, uh, it's not my favorite thing to do. And then you get to your, fi finally you're about to approach the city where you're going to land, and they say, ah, they're going to put us in a holding pattern. So all you do is go in circles, round and round and round. I mean, you can't wait to get off of that. You just want to get out of that plane and get on with your life. Well, sometimes it might seem like our life is in a holding pattern, like nothing is really happening. I've been praying for this breakthrough. Nothing's, nothing's happening. I'm praying for this open door. I'm praying for this promotion. I'm praying for my loved ones. Nothing seems to be going on. I'm just going in circles. Well, let me tell you. A day can make a difference. You don't give up, you don't throw in the towel, and don't ever fall into the snare of thinking God doesn't hear your prayers or that he's not working behind the scenes. Because obviously, the Lord was working behind the scenes. Joseph was in God's hands right there in the prison. God knew what was going on. Sometimes you might be tempted to say, Lord, don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you see what's going on in my life? But you know, the Lord knows. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows your address. Knows what's happening in your life. So the Lord was working in a powerful way at this time in Joseph's life. In fact, he was preparing him for promotion. He was preparing him for the limelight. He was going to be thrust into a position of fame and authority and power and prominence that he could not have imagined. It's, you know, sometimes I get a little outdone when I hear preachers talking about, well, you've got to have a vision. You've got to have this. They make a big deal out of having a vision. And sometimes I even wonder what, they, what they're talking about exactly because that's not really what the Bible says, that without a vision the people perish that's uh it's not a vision for prominence and power and success but we're supposed to hold on to the word of god and trust him to bless us keep us provide for us heal us deliver us you know joseph could not have had a vision to be pharaoh's right hand man <laughs> In fact, people would have thought he was a little nuts. But, uh, you know, the Lord had to mold this young man. You remember, Joseph is still young. He's a young man. And youth has its inherent weaknesses, Matt, perhaps, or temptations, perhaps. Because when you're young, you tend to be, you know, you're strong. You think that you can do anything, maybe, or accomplish anything if you just put your mind to it you don't really realize yet that you're frail and weak and that you hold on to this life with a very tenacious hold that uh, death is only a lack of a heartbeat away but all the things joseph had gone through was preparing him for what came next sometimes we don't think of things in that way but you know the prison was part of Joseph's preparation. Potiphar's house was part of Joseph's preparation. He learned a lot of things in Potiphar's house. He learned how to manage. He had no experience managing before. But in Potiphar's house, where he kept being given more and more authority, he learned how to manage. That would come in real handy one day when he managed all of Egypt. 
He learned some things in the prison that he could not have learned elsewhere. He learned how to deal with disappointment. He learned how to deal with surly and difficult people. He learned how to handle false accusations and slander. He knew that not everybody was going to like him. You know, in prison, it's not the most savory people that you're around. And him being in a place of authority in the prison, you know, not everybody was happy. But he learned a lot. He learned, he learned to overcome the disappointments, the discouragements. All of these things were part of his growth. God had to mold this young man and turn him into the, the man he needed him to be. And you know the way God molds us through trial, difficulty, adversity, affliction, I think that by the time these two years passed, Joseph was all out of personal ambitions. I believe the only thing he desired now was let me get out of this hole in the ground. And if I can get out of here, maybe I can make my way home. Maybe my father's even still alive. Maybe, maybe I can get back home where I belong. But You know, in chapter 41, we're going to read this chapter. It's a rather lengthy chapter. Uh, So just for convenience sake, I've divided it up into five sections, I believe. But we're going to look at this first section where Pharaoh has a pair of frightening dreams. We're in Genesis 41, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine. These would be cows, cattle. Seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, good, fat, healthy cows. And they fed in a meadow, nice green field. And behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ill-favored, lean-fleshed. Now, these were some scrawny, terrible-looking, looked like they starving to death cows. And they stood by the other cows on the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed cows did eat up the seven well-favored and fat cows. So Pharaoh woke up. Then he went back to sleep and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank. It means fat, fat and good. And seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank or fat and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. And verse 8, it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told him his dream. There was none that could interpret the dream unto Pharaoh. A terrible, frightening dream. You know, sometimes a dream means absolutely nothing. In fact, most of the time they mean nothing. Uh, The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, that a dream comes through the multitude of business. That is, that's what Ecclesiastes says. A dream comes through a multitude of business. That is, busyness, activity, a lot of things going on in your life, a lot of things on your mind, running, going, coming. All of these activities, whirlwinds of stuff, you go to bed, you're tired, you're exhausted, you dream. And you know... You know, the experts tell us, for whatever the experts supposedly know, the psychology today, they tell us everybody dreams. Now, some people say they never dream, but the experts say they actually do dream, they just don't remember their dreams. Because, you know, your brain, when you're asleep, your brain is not in save mode, you know, where it saves information. So, you're asleep, and 95% of what you dream, you never remember. But... And they say most people have multiple dreams during the night, dream all kind of things. Uh, and, 
and and there are certain things that people dream regularly, like you know, like you're falling, or like uh, maybe you're being chased, or you ever have the dream where it's like you're paralyzed and you can't even speak or you can't move or. They say these are pretty common dreams and everybody goes through it. In fact, they even say animals probably dream. Sometimes people's dogs have a big old smile on his face while he's sound asleep. His tail will be wagging and he looks like he's as happy as can be. Probably dreams he's eating off of your table or something. But, uh, but the Bible says that it's through a multitude of busyness that we dream. I've also discovered if you eat pizza late, you tend to dream. Yeah. But, but all of those dreams mean basically nothing, which, you know, Ecclesiastes 5 goes on to say, in the multitude of dreams and in many words is vanity. Uh, and again, the idea being, for the most part, it's just your mind going to sleep, processing all the busyness, and stupid stuff comes out, you know. just. Uh. But I also know, that sometimes people dream things that can really trouble them and really frighten them. You've heard of nightmares. Nightmare is an old English word. It actually means night demon. Because uh, in the old days, they believed that demons could trouble people at night and terrify them and uh, haunt them. Actually, they, uh, they attributed the nightmare to the incubus that molested people. It was a female demon in, in legend and, and so forth. But uh, nightmares. Sometimes, you know, you have to plead the blood over your mind. And, and I've had to tell people that several times. You, you, if you're having nightmares, you need to plead the blood of Jesus over your mind, rebuke the devil, rebuke the demons, and make sure you're not opening doors somewhere. Uh, you know, horror movies and things like that. I do believe that's an open door. Ooh, I let my child watch horror movies and they can't sleep at night. Okay, yeah, exactly. Let's add that up. Horror movies can't sleep. There may be a connection. Yeah. I couldn't sleep if I watched horror movies. <laughs> but also, we know that dreams can come from God. Because the Lord in the Bible spoke many times to people through dreams. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, one of the things the, the Bible says the Lord will do is that he'll speak to all men in their dreams. <laughs> in the last days, saith the Lord, Acts 2.17, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. The idea being that, you know, the Lord will still speak. And sometimes the vehicle that he uses to speak to us is through, through a dream uh, that, that he can speak. Look, you read the Bible, you see God spoke many times to people in dreams. He told old King Abimelech, you better not touch that man's wife. That's another man's wife. Remember when he took Sarah? He said, oh, that's a beautiful woman. Abraham said, yeah, that's my sister. God told Abraham, uh, told Abimelech, in a dream, you touch her, you're a dead man. That was God in the dream. He said, you touch her, you're a dead man. He said, that's another man's wife. The Lord spoke through dreams many times. Jacob dreamed a dream. He saw a ladder going up to heaven, angels ascending and descending on it. And, and, and Jacob said, surely this is the house of God. And he changed the name of that place from Luz to Bethel. Many Many times the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, at least twice, uh, and told Solomon one time, you tell me what you want. Now that you're going to be king over all of Israel, tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. In a dream, the Lord had appeared to him. And several times dreams came to Joseph, who would be the Mary's husband, because he, he saw his wife, was, uh, Mary was pregnant, and he hadn't touched her, and he was going to Put her away, the Bible says. Not That doesn't mean kill her, by the way. That means it's going to, in their engagement, not marry her. And the Lord, a dream. He had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord said, don't be afraid to marry her. Because the child she's going to have is from the Holy Ghost. And later, in a dream, the Lord told him, you and your, and your wife, and, and you take the child, and you all get out of 
Israel and you go to Egypt for now because, oh, Herod's looking to kill him. I mean, in dreams. The Lord can speak in dreams. We know that. Well, sometimes people have dreams and they know that it was important. I know this dream meant something. I know, I know that this was a significant dream. I know this wasn't just one of those pizza dreams or just one of the busy in my mind dreams. I know this dream meant something. Sometimes you just have to get before the Lord to ask the Lord what it, what it means. Now, in this case, old Pharaoh knew this dream meant something. It troubled him. It deeply troubled him. Well, it should have. Because in this dream, I want you to think about something. He saw the fat cows of Egypt, big, fat, full flesh, the Bible says. And then some scrawny, horrible looking, diseased, famine looking cows came up and ate the fat ones. And yet the skinny ones still looked skinny. And then he saw the crops of Egypt, big grains of corn, wheat, a full, plentiful, And then scrawny, blasted corn wheat came up and devoured the fat and still was skinny and blasted by mildew and the east wind. Now, let me tell you how significant this is, and this is why he's so deeply troubled. You take away Egypt's cattle, their flocks. You take away Egypt's wheat. You've decimated their entire food supply. You're talking about crashing the economy of a nation and uh, leading a people into starvation. He's deeply troubled. He's very deeply troubled. And all the magicians, the wise men, the soothsayers, all the ones who were so good at interpreting dreams, no interpretation. And then beginning in verse 9, Then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. You know, now the king's upset. Nobody can interpret his dream. And here's the butler says, you know what? I remember a guy when we were thrown in jail back those two years ago who interpreted my dreams. He said, verse 10, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants. He put me in ward in the Captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker, we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. We told him and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dreams, he did interpret. Verse 13, it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored to my office, him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. He said, go get him. Bring that young man to me. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and he came unto Pharaoh. Go get him. Now, after two years in a hole, I don't think they had, you know, nice sanitation facilities, showers, and, you know, old Joseph was probably pretty rank. (laughs) Hair, beard, matted, and clothing rotting off of him, stinky, moldy. Let's say he was unpresentable. And, of course, the Egyptians were famous for shaving their heads and shaving their bodies, really. So they sent for him, cleaned him up. I'm sure he would have wanted to clean himself up anyway. And verse 15, they brought him unto Pharaoh. Verse 15, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. There is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. I hear that you can interpret dreams. I need you to tell me. Tell me. Tell me about these these dreams. Tell me what they mean. And here's Jacob's chance. 
Opportunity is knocking. I mean, if there was ever a time for him to toot his horn, this is it. You know, he could take credit for his previous track record. He could put his best foot forward. It was time for him to let his abilities and talents be known. Here's his chance to get out of jail. Here's his chance to get his 15 minutes of fame. But I like his answer in verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not in me. I can't take any credit. That's what he says. God, on the other hand, will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Uh, Kyle and Delich, the Old Testament Hebrew scholars, interpret this to say, when he says, it's not in me. They said, it's not in my power. That's what Joseph said. It's not in my power. I can't interpret dreams. I have to depend on God to tell me. Uh, I can't take any credit. But this is what he says. God will tell Pharaoh what he desires to know. I see two real big things here that stand out in my mind. I see Joseph's humility. He's not going to take any credit. He's not looking to be in the limelight. He's not looking to pound his chest and say, that's right, I can do it. Y'all follow me? He's, uh, he's not saying anything about this being about him, but he does have absolute confidence in God. He said, God will give you the answer. You desire an answer, God's going to give you an answer. Faith, absolute faith, and yet at the same time, humility. Now, that's a winning combination. Personal humility and yet unwavering faith and confidence in God. Now, these are qualities that we should not only see here, but that we should seek to imitate, emulate in our lives. You know, Joseph is just a man like you and me. Just a man. But he's a man who has been through some terrible experiences in his young life. And those experiences made him the man that he was and prepared him for the position that God was going to thrust him into. Because let me tell you, if he had been full of himself, then God could not have used him the way he did. A man full of himself, given that kind of power, prominence, prestige, 30 years old, that would be a dangerous combination. But because this was a broken man, A.W. Toza used to write, he said, I'm convinced that before God can use someone greatly, he must hurt them deeply. Yeah. Now, that might think, you might think that that doesn't even make sense. But we see it over and over again in Scripture. Before a person can be of fit use for the Lord, they must be broken. You know, like... The alabaster box had to be broken for the fragrance to be released. Well, sometimes the Lord has to break us. There's pride, there's ego, there's all this self, self-righteousness, self-esteem, wanting to get our own way. We're, we tend to be independent, we're headstrong, we're stubborn, we're defiant in so many ways, rebellious. We've got our own opinions, our own ideas. Whatever Joseph went into prison with, it all got crushed in prison. What didn't get crushed, his pride broken when Potiphar's wife accused him falsely. Can I tell you something? That'll do something to you. You get accused of something as horrendous as that, and it's false, it's a lie, and you, you can't really prove it or vindicate yourself. And people think terrible of you. And people who don't even know you are saying bad things about you. That'll do something to you. That'll break your heart. It'll crush you. But, you know, there are things in us that need to be crushed. There's this self, this reputation that we think we're so proud of. There's so many things about the self that the Lord has to break in us in order for the real fragrance of Christ to be produced in us and released. Humility is a prize, but it doesn't come by reading a book. It comes by 
the experiences we have of being broken and rejected and spit upon and denounced and lied about. And look, you can kick against those goads. You can scream and yell and shout and be angry and defiant and threaten. But that means you're not allowing the self to go to the cross. You know when the Lord said we have to take up our cross and follow Him? You know that's what it means. We allow our self to be crucified. Instead of screaming and yelling and threatening at everybody else and blaming God, we allow self to go to the cross and you allow yourself to die to that. You all awake? You all follow me? You allow self to be crucified. You can resurrect it. You know, it it, it resurrects itself. You you really have to keep the, uh, the flesh on the cross, but... Who the Lord crushes, let me tell you, if, you, if you'll allow yourself to die, there will come a resurrection. But it'll be God doing it. <laughs> and here we have old Joseph. I don't have any answers for you, Pharaoh. But I know the one who does. And he will give you an answer. There's confidence. There's faith. There's character. There's humility. Such a man or a woman God can use. There are things that's going to happen in your life if they haven't happened already that will break your heart. People will tell you things that will hurt you down to the core of your being. Accusations and charges may fly towards you from people that you loved and people you thought loved you. And maybe they do. But you know, sometimes the devil will use the people we love to hurt us. Now, you can respond like the devil in them. Or you can die. And when I say die, you know what I'm talking about. We die to the self. We die to the flesh. We die to the reputation. We die to our ego. We die to our pride. And we overcome. And we pray, just like the Lord said, you pray for your enemies. You turn the other cheek. You go the second mile. I mean, the very least, we should be able to do that for our own loved ones and family members and friends and associates. And sometimes even in church, people get hurt, hurt, wounded. And sometimes we say things we don't we don't even realize how it's coming across or or how it may affect another person. And uh, I know I've been guilty, not intentionally, but. Well, Pharaoh's dream is now interpreted, beginning in verse 17. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream I stood upon the bank of the river. Verse 18, Behold, there came up out of the river seven fat cows. They fed in the meadow. And he tells him the dream. After them came up seven very poor, very ill-favored, lean flesh, such as I've never seen in all the land of Egypt, for badness. These were some evil-looking, scrawny cows. And the lean and ill-favored ate the first seven And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them up. They were still ill-favored as at the beginning. And then that woke me up. And then he said, I saw my dream. Seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And then seven ears withered, thin, blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. The thin ears devoured the seven good ears. I told this to the magicians. There was none that could declare it to me. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream... That you had is one. It's one dream that is one in meaning. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. Seven fat cows, seven fat ears of corn. That's one dream. The seven ill and ill-favored kind that came up after them, thin and ill-favored, that's seven years. The seven empty 
ears blasted with the east wind, that's going to be seven years of famine. And this is the thing that I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he shows unto Pharaoh. This dream you had, this pair of dreams, actually it's one dream, one meaning. God is showing you what he's about to do. There's going to come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 30, there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. The plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine that follows. It will be very grievous. And for that reason, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh. Twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. The crops and the flocks all devoured. No wonder Pharaoh was so frightened. And then Joseph advises Pharaoh, the most important man perhaps on the planet at the time, Pharaoh, you know, most powerful Joseph is going to advise him. Verse 33, 34, 35, 36. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh. Let them keep food in the cities and that shall be for store in the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine. You notice that while Joseph told him, this is what you need to do, he didn't say, look, I'm volunteering for the position. You know, I'd I'd be the guy. I'm your man. He's not really tooting his own horn here. And, And I also believe that what we see right here in this advice that Joseph gives Pharaoh is an example of what will come to be called in the New Testament, a word of wisdom. You know, the Bible speaks uh, in 1 Corinthians about the spiritual gifts, non-spiritual gifts, communication gifts, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, revelation gifts, communication gifts. You know, there, there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks of a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. These are revelation gifts. A word of knowledge has to do with God showing a person who's operating in this gift. This is a supernatural gift. You can't make it up, manufacture it. Uh, you know, it's not in you to produce it. God has to drop this in a person's heart. Amen. But it could be that God would drop in your heart at some time a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is you become aware by divine revelation. God speaks to you about a situation that is either present tense or past tense. And sometimes, you know, you might hear somebody say, you know, the Lord's just showing me that that there's somebody here that's been suffering with, uh, you know, maybe some particular ailment. Uh, somebody's been having a pain in their eye. I mean, just a real throbbing, nagging pain in their eye. Uh, the Lord's just showing me that. So if that's you, then... You know, you reach out by faith right now and, and receive your healing. That's not hokey. Let me tell you, the Lord does things like that. We must believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's a word of knowledge because it's something that is either present tense or past tense. Because it could also be a, a past tense event that, that a word of knowledge refers to. It's something that you wouldn't know except the Lord told you. Uh, there's... There's been a few times I know for sure that the Lord used me in a word of knowledge. I remember one time I was getting ready to preach and I had this overwhelming just realization that somebody in the church had consumed the fumes of a chemical and that they were suffering from it in their lungs. Now, you know, that's not something you would just think of. 
But it came to me so profoundly that I mentioned it. And one of the guys in the church, wouldn't you know, he got up, he said, that just happened to me. It just happened to me yesterday. And he said, I can't hardly breathe. And so we prayed for him. And the Lord touched him. And, uh, you know, the guy's still alive today. So I'm assuming that, I'm assuming he was healed. <laughs> and, and there have been a few other occasions. I was witnessing with somebody one time. The guy standing next to me, all of a sudden he's witnessing to a fellow. He has this word of knowledge and he starts telling this guy about his past. And the fellow said, how could you know that? He said, the Lord just showed me. That's a word of knowledge because it's of either current, present, or past events. But let me tell you what a word of wisdom is. It is supernatural revelation of what you should do. Future. What you should do. Here is an example. Because, again, you know, this is not in Joseph. He said, it's not in me, but God will show you, Pharaoh. God will show you. And then he gives Pharaoh this profound advice. This is an example of what in the New Testament would be called a word of wisdom. Now, you take someone and you appoint them over this business of gathering up one-fifth of all the produce of Egypt. Can you imagine this job? Gathering, supervising, uh, storing, all the buildings you'd have to build. And you're talking about some very complex uh, organization here. And this is exactly what Joseph tells Pharaoh to do. And Pharaoh, well, Pharaoh says, this is exactly what we need to do. Verse 37, the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, all his servants. Pharaoh said, verse 38, to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? There's no question in Pharaoh's mind. Joseph's God spoke to him. Pharaoh said to Joseph, as far as much as God has shown you all this, there is none as discreet and wise as you, so you'll be over all my house. And according to your word, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand. He arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. What a difference a day makes. <laughs> Can you just hold on a little bit longer? What a difference a day makes. You know what the Bible says? It says promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, nor does it come from the south. It says promotion comes from the Lord. He puts down one, he raises up another. James 4, verse 10, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Amen. Or oh, how about this one? I really like this verse. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, Amen. that He may exalt you in due time. In due time. In His time. And right now, it was time. <laughs> It was Joseph's time to be exalted. He had humbled himself all of those years. You know, he's been 13 years in Egypt now. 13 years. A slave in Egypt. But all of those 13 years had served their purpose. And they produced the man that he was. And the man that God was going to use. Sometimes you may think that the things you did in the past uh, were just wasted years and of no value whatsoever. But actually, there are many things, many lessons you can draw from those things, even when they were 
even when they were stupid things. My brother Billy spent years in prison. And you might think that, man, you talk about wasted years. Well, you know, at the same time, God can take what was bad and cause it to produce character. Character. And uh, he might not have ever got saved if it wasn't for those years. Because in prison, he committed his life to Christ. As we've seen with others. I spent 10 years cutting hair. 10 years. And you wonder what, what wasted years those were. I mean, I, what if I had just gone to Bible school right out of high school or something? Amen. And yet at the same time, I have to say there were things I learned. Uh, things that I, I can look back and see things that God did in me in all those years. Uh, that help formulate the person you become. You know, you deal with people every day, all day. People, 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 all kinds of people. And uh, people who, who will confide in you, people who are hurt, people who are going through all kinds of terrible experiences. I see whether I, I have drawn from those experiences. I can see it to this day. I learned a little bit about management, but not enough to make me a manager. <laughs> but my point being that from our past, we've all learned things and uh, they have all worked in some way to hone us and, and mold us into the person that we have become. And, of course, in Joseph's case, he went from the prison to the palace. Amen. How about... You talk about a difference, a difference a day makes. He took off his prison clothes and he's been given the wardrobe of a prince, verse 42 says. He took off chains and shackles and he puts, Pharaoh puts his own signet ring on him and puts a gold chain on his neck. That's a nice exchange, you know, prison shackles, or handcuffs, or leg irons. He went from helping a jailer run a dark, dank dungeon to being second in command over all of Egypt. He is now the most second, he's the second most powerful person perhaps in the world. Pharaoh, leader of Egypt, ruled. And now he says, Joseph, you're second in command. You take my ring. Now the king's ring, that's his seal. And not only that, but Pharaoh says, you know what? I have two chariots. You get my other chariot. And not only that, but you know how I ride through the city in my chariot? And all the people are told, you bow before Pharaoh. Now they're going to bow before you. That's not bad for a 30-year-old Jewish boy. They'll bow before you. They'll, all, in other words, they'll give you the same honor and respect they give to Pharaoh himself. Now, I want you to think about something. If Joseph was a less man than what he was, this would be a bad time to have been one of Joseph's enemies. This would have been a bad time to be somebody in the jail who was always aggravating him or defying him or calling him names or because now he's second in command over all of Egypt. It would have been a bad time to be Potiphar's wife or even Potiphar if Joseph was a lesser man. But you know, the prison, the accusations, all of those things had done a work in him. They broke him. They humbled him. So that there was in him no drive for revenge. No drive to get even. No drive for vindication. God had vindicated him. Y'all awake? Let's keep a couple things in mind here. What was going on? Uh, because things were changing and changing rapidly. Verse 45 Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath-Paneah. 
It means, uh, allow me to paraphrase, this guy can reveal secrets. <laughs> the man who can reveal secrets. And he gave him to wife Ezanath, the daughter of Potipera, priest of On, or as the margin reads, prince of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went out throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls, and he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up all the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city. And he laid up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering. It was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest or prince of own, bare unto him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, says he, has made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. Manasseh means forgetting, forgetting. Amen. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness that were in the land of Egypt were ended. Ephraim, by the way, means fruitful. Interesting uh, turn of events here. Uh, verse 46 tells us at this point, Joseph was 30 years old. He's a very young man. Think of this, 30 years old, second in command over the entire nation of Egypt. And really, I mean, Egypt was perhaps the most powerful nation on earth at the time. That's a lot of power for a 30-year-old man. Not only all this power, all this prestige, all this fame, they're bowing before him. Not only that, you know, he's 30 years old and he is good looking, the Bible says. He's a good looking, well favored, well built man. All this power, all this prominence, all this prestige, it would be enough to ruin the average person, really and truly. Power can ruin a person, success can ruin a person. If he had been less a man, That's right. it would have ruined him. Uh, but all these life experiences, every single one of them, made him the person that he was. Amen. So that now he could not only impact a nation, he could impact the world. I don't believe the Lord could have used him if he had been a different kind of man. Amen. And maybe that's why the Lord passes by many people because they're so full of themselves. That's right. they, the Lord just can't use them. So, seven years of plenty. During those seven years of plenty, Joseph was given a wife. Now, the Bible doesn't give us any details about his wife, but... You know, I let my mind fill in the details the way I kind of like them. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I would think, now this is just Brother Rusty, but I would think God is blessing Joseph now, right? He is rewarding Joseph. This is the time of blessing and fruitfulness. So I believe he gave him a good wife. I don't believe he would have cursed him. At this point, with the witch of Endor. This is. Now, she was a pagan wife because, you know, as a pagan land, but I don't believe it was very long before his wife embraced his God. Because even as Pharaoh said, Look, your God, he definitely speaks to you. Your God's God. I'm convinced that this woman was something. That was a gift from God for Joseph. Amen. Something he, you know, he hadn't had. He hadn't had a companion. All these years, he's been alone. All these years in Egypt, he's been alone. But God blessed him with a help me, with a wife that I know he loved, and, and she 
loved him. And you know what you don't read about in, with Joseph? Where he took all kind of multiple wives and so forth. Well, he saw from his own experience what, what that leads to. He loved his wife. He treasured his wife. And she gave him a son. And they named him Forgetting. Because for the first time, he was healed of all the terrible things that he had been through. Now, you know, you start thinking about forgetting. What would Joseph have forgotten? Certainly, he he wouldn't have forgotten that his brothers betrayed him. He wouldn't forget that he heard them arguing whether to kill him or not. Uh, That they ripped this uh, coat of many colors off of him and threw him in a hole. He wouldn't forget that. He wouldn't forget that they sold him as a slave And as the caravan walked away into the desert going to Egypt, he looked back at his brothers. Those are are things you never forget. He wouldn't have forgotten standing on an auction block and being sold to the highest bidder. He wouldn't have forgotten his years in servitude at Potiphar's house or the false accusations that she made against him. He wouldn't have forgotten his years in jail. So what was he forgetting then if he named his child Forgetting? I believe what he forgot here was all the pain, the deep dagger in the heart that uh, that could have turned him bitter. But you know the old expression, your experiences in life will make you either bitter or better. And uh, in Joseph's case, he allowed them to make him better. Had he become bitter, God could not have promoted him. If he had been a bitter, angry man, then his rise to power would have been a terrifying thing Amen. for many, many people in Egypt. But he is a man who got out of jail. He got out of all the, the fetters and chains, and he refused to be fettered and chained by anger, resentment, unforgiveness, hate, rage. You know, those are chains too. Those things are chains. You carry all that around, you're carrying a... A 40-pound weight uh, everywhere you go. You, you're chained up. You might not be in jail, but you're chained. Chained with all that anger and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. There are things we have to let go. I mean, there are things we must forgive. Amen. Joseph forgave. That's right. He said, so I'm, cha- I'm, I'm going to call my son forgetting. I'm going to forget that. I mean, this guy, what an example of Romans eight twenty eight. all things working together for good. He knew that all that stuff would poison him if he allowed it to remain in his heart. He can't, he can't allow it. And the second son, I'm going to name him fruitful because God has blessed me. And that's what it means. God has blessed him and God blessed him plenty. And then the famine came. The Bible says, after the seven years of plenty were ended, verse 54, the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was Famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go see the special man. (laughs) Go see Joseph and bring money. (laughs) And what he says to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now, the famine that started in Egypt spread throughout all the surrounding nations. And now these nations are going hungry and lacking, but they're hearing that there was a wise leader over in Egypt who had the foresight to store up seven years' worth of grain for famine. And the stage is set for what will be quite a reunion just ahead. 
We'll have to save that for next time. <laughs> but let's, let's take home with us today the realization that the Lord is always working in our lives. And, you know, even when you were not saved, you know the Lord was working in your life then. Even then there were things going on in your life that you to this day can draw from lessons you learned. And even if it's stupid stuff that you realize, you know, I'll never do that again. <laughs> but the Lord can make our experiences, even, even the things that were stupid that we did, uh, He can make them work somehow for our good. Uh, and in all the difficulties of life, we're all going to go through them. Sorrows, tragedies, griefs, problems, disappointments. It's part of life, you know. It's all part of life. And people who haven't learned to just trust the Lord, to be able to cope, you have to feel sorry for them. You have to feel sorry for them because they, they, they come unraveled. They're, to them, the world is just a frightening place. Despite all the things that go on in the world, you should have peace as a Christian. You should have peace knowing that your God reigns. He knows right where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. You should have peace. You say, Brother Rusty, the whole world is going to hell. It's all falling apart. I know. Believe me, I know. But through it all, we know that we serve the living God who is faithful to keep us and preserve us and bring us safely through. And what if, what if He doesn't bring us safely through? What if we die? We'll, be with him. Amen. <laughs> well, the Bible says, you know, Paul says, well, you know, for me to die is gain. To die is gain. <clears throat> then my probationary period is over. And I graduate to glory. Death should hold no fear for the believer. Amen. Don't fall into the prison of anger, resentment, bitterness, rage, unforgiveness. You can't, that's prison. You can't fall into that prison. And I'll tell you something else. Just like God could not have used Joseph if he came out of the physical jail and got into an emotional jail, neither can God really use you Amen. if you're tied up in, into that kind of prison. Right. You really want to break free, then you forgive. How can you forgive somebody who hurt you deeply? Joseph did it. So that when his brothers came, he was able to fall on them and hug their necks. And we'll get to that. We'll get there. But what an example. What Christ-likeness we see in his ability to forgive and to completely forgive. And to even say all the things that you, that you did out of an evil heart. You know, the Lord allowed it. But it was to produce a change so that God could promote him to this place of second in command over all of Egypt. First Peter 5, I'm going to close with these two verses. I already read, I'm going to read them again. Verse 6 and 7, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Praise God. Well, Father, we do pray today. We, we thank you, Lord, that in your word you include the accounts of these godly examples like Joseph. We thank you, Lord, that we can learn by such things, by studying the lives of men, men like us. And Lord, I pray, I pray for everyone here, everyone who hears this message, that you would minister to our hearts. Help us, Lord Jesus, to forgive, to choose to forgive. to walk humbly before you and to trust you in all things, knowing, Lord, that this you desire from us and this you approve of. Lord, we pray it 
In Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have uh, ever read Corey Ten Boom's book, uh, The Hiding Place? Okay, there's a few of you. Well, well listen, Corey Ten Boom, uh, I don't even know if her book is still in print, but if you can find it, it's called The Hiding Place. I, I highly recommend this book. It's a story of a, a, a woman and her sister who were thrown into a Nazi concentration camp. And the terrible things they endured there. And the spirit of God that was on this woman. She was released from prison from a Nazi concentration camp just hours before everybody in the whole camp was killed. The story of her life is quite miraculous. But there came a day many, many years later where she was speaking in a meeting. And she was just telling people about the grace of God. And there in the back came the man who was the guard, one of the guards at the prison, at the concentration camp. And this man was in the back of the meeting. And she saw him. Now this man had oppressed them, injured them in ways that were just unimaginable. And he came up afterwards. You know, he didn't recognize her. But she would never forget him. And that, at the end, he came up to her. He wanted to meet this woman, this speaker. And when he extended his hand to shake her hand, can you imagine the things that she felt? How can I shake the hand of this man who I hold responsible for my sister's death, my parents' death, all my friends' deaths, the horrible years I spent in this concentration camp? And she said within herself, God, it is not in me. You know, just like Joseph said, it's not in me. But Lord, give me the grace. If, you know, if God can forgive somebody, then can we? And so she held out her hand and she said when she touched that man's hand, such a flood of God's presence came through her. Look, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice. And God will give you the grace if you will ask Him. Just ask Him, Lord, give me the grace that I need right now. And by this grace you give, I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. Now, some need to forgive Their spouse, because you know spouses can say some terrible things to each other, especially unsaved ones. Forgive them. Let that self go to the cross. You know, this is part of the dying process. It's what molds our character. You forgive. You be the overcomer. You die. You let that part of your ego and self and pride die. You take up the cross. You be the overcomer. And you don't announce it. Amen. Say, well, I see you're going to act like the devil, so I'm going to be the overcomer here. Here, here I am. P- pay attention now. <laughs> this is what overcoming looks like. <laughs> no, you let the cross have its work. Amen. And the Lord, the Lord will mold our character. Amen. If we can pray with you this morning, please give us the opportunity to do so.